That's a wizard. A hundred percent. Calling the game right now. I'm dressed like the Michelin man, ready to get my f on. A really good team that shouldn't have been. Oh, seven different teams won conference championships. U of A, not one of them. I just wanted to point that out. But uh, hey, welcome everybody to the Sports Experience Podcast. I am Dom Tola sitting alongside Chris Quinn and. Chris, are you ready for some hockey? Yeah, man. Yeah. Ready to check out one of the best wingers. Yeah, one of the best wingers and best goal scorers uh, through the 90s and early 2000s. Yeah. Uh, today we're talking, we're going behind the Iron Curtain. We're talking Pavel Bure, everybody. All right, give me it. Where was he uh, born? He was born in Moscow, or should I say from Clerks, Moscow. There you go. <laughs> born uh, uh, March 31st, 1971 to Vladimir and Tatiana Bure. Uh, very athletic family, yeah, from his, what I understand. His dad was a legendary swimmer. Yeah, Vladimir um, was uh, uh, competed for the Soviet Union in the 68, 72, and 76 Olympics. Yep. And medaled, never gold, but got some silvers. Uh, earned two, uh, Yeah, four medals. Um, and his father, Valery, was a w- Olympic water polo player, which was pretty cool. And um, his brother, Valerie, who we'll also bring up at some point, uh, was an NHL All-Star, too. Yeah. So a lot of athletic genes running through this family. One thing I wanted to bring up I found interesting. Do you want to get into it, his family origin, how they got to Russia? Oh, yeah, okay. Or the Soviet Union or whatever we want to call it now. So uh, his family immigrated from Switzerland, and his family were watchmakers. And they were for watchmakers for some very important people, Chris. Um, for the czar, am I correct? Yep. So from 1815 to 1917, they were the official watchmakers for the Russian czars. So they pretty much imported this family and yeah. they were like, you're Russians now. You but make like us watches. Yeah. The they, time. <laughs> they would just make Russia or just make these watches that I bet are, I mean, they're pretty incredible. To yeah. Look at. Yeah. They're pretty sweet. Um, but they, last till 1917 they had noble status and i'm kind of wondering how the hell were they not murdered by well this was the the thing when the soviet union when the revolution came around a lot of these people were without a doubt murdered his family in particular who were like directly you know in Mm. this royal line so the fact that that his family survived maybe had to do with the sporting thing maybe had to do with the the switzerland you know what i mean the their country of origin it's hard to say why they survived but god that would be interesting about it i was just fascinated by that yeah um because literally they were killing all of these families and not just like their their dads they were like murdering like the all kulaks and yeah. everyone just like v- low-level farmers who didn't want the government yes. coming in like yeah but anyway back on uh pavel bure the, <laughs> with the watches i did want to bring up one last thing oh yeah in 1995 when he was hurt um which we'll get into later um he tried to start the uh, watchmaking business again and made three specialized watches for boris yeltsin the Russian uh, president. He also made one for the prime minister. I can't pronounce that last name, so I'm not going to try. And then uh, made it for the Moscow mayor. Oh, yeah. Which is pretty cool. That's pretty cool, in uh, in my opinion. It was in his blood. I'll tell you what. It's blood. sporting and watching. Sporting and watching. <laughs> oh, watching is a sport. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sitting up in a tree? No, dirty peepers. Anyway, um, as a kid, he always wanted to play hockey, which his dad really wasn't a fan of. Yeah. Because his dad's a former swimmer, and grandpa's a water polo player. Um, and hockey doesn't have the allure at that time. I mean, you're in Russia. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, it's almost just kind of like a kid's game. It is. And uh, at age six, his dad puts him on the uh, CSK, CSKA Moscow team, um, like on a junior team. Um, his dad, he failed in his first tryout for it. Well, because the only hockey he'd played up to that point was like a Russian version of street hockey. He had never really been on skates and yeah. not skates while playing hockey. So it was, um, which is amazing when you look at what he became. <laughs> well, this is the thing because he's six years old, and we we saw this at the Rodney Mullen episode where his dad said, "You get better in two months, or I'm not going to let you play this anymore." Yeah. So he literally was a. I have two months to do this as much as I can. And that's when he, I mean, starts putting in the time to where he really becomes a great hockey player like three or four years later. He goes to the CSKA Moscow um, Hockey School, and at age 11, he's the league's best forward. 
So he rapidly improves. Yep. And one of you know the league's best players. Um, and in July of 1987, he is one of three Russian kids to uh, play a kind of you know staged game with Wayne Gretzky and uh, Vladislav Tretiak, yeah. who was that amazing goalie for those big red machine teams um, back in the day. Um, at age 14, yeah, um, he was on the uh, Central Pro Army Junior team. I love these Russian names. Man. Oh, I know. They're just like to the point and just weird. Um, in December 86, goes on a Canada tour, and uh, they end the tour in Vancouver um, with kind of all these good Russian youngsters, and that'll definitely come back into play later. <laughs> well, it's interesting because he is in this era looked at as like the best young in the in this team of like the best young that russia has to offer well and what the soviets have at this point is just a glut of young talent who will be amazing players in the nhl down the line like a sergey fedorov or an alexander mcgillney i mean this this is basically where the detroit red wings start building up a monster of a team yeah no Um, seriously and it's interesting because and he's in one of those first guys that it's hard for him to get out of Russia. Well, yeah, because you can't leave. I mean, you can defect like McGillney, but like defecting from a regime like that, is, a country like that, is not easy. Or you can get in a lot of trouble, and your also family, your family yeah. is in a lot of trouble. That's what he said when asked later in his career if defecting was like an option for him and he was just like no i was just gonna wait it out because yeah. my brother was in the in the hockey yeah, federation his brother. Yeah. Mm-hmm. so like it, he he was like his whole family was just like very out there you know what i mean yeah. so it, it was it was not going to be good if he defected and they're left easy his brother. to find chris yes exactly which means easy to imprison for anything you want um at 16 he makes the adult csk moscow uh signs another training camp but in 87 88 that year he's still too young to play and scored only one goal. So they're trying to bring him up kind of slowly. So he plays like five games. And he's not a big dude. I mean, as an adult, he's 5'10", 191. Yeah, he's never a big man. So he's probably a little more lithe, um, uh, lighter at this point uh, in his career. Um, in 88, 89, he's flat out killing it. Leads the league in goals scored with 17. Um, a record which stood until 2006, 2007. And... Uh, they win uh, 13 straight games that year, the team. So they're just absolutely killing it, like with Fedorov, McGillney, uh, Igor Larionov. He was another really good player. Sergei Markarov, uh, Konstantinov, and uh, Fetisov, who later played for the Red Wings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in uh, 1991, uh, 90-91, um, he also ties for the league lead with 46 points, 35 goals. We're second in the league. And uh, he, turned down, he turns down an extension in August of 91, which keeps him off the Canada Cup team. And this Russian franchise is none too pleased with him because yeah. they know what's coming. They know, they know he's leaving. Yeah, they know that um, he's basically on his way out and that NHL teams are now – Excited to draft Russian players, well, <laughs> players from the Soviet Union. I want to talk about when he was drafted yes, originally. Yes, please. Can we go into this? So we go back to 87, 88. He mm-hmm. plays five games, and you can't, because of his age, you can't draft a player unless they've played 11 games. Yeah. Vancouver's director saw that he played some exhibition games and a couple of international games that made his game total like 12. Yeah. So he was eligible to be drafted in the 89 draft, and Vancouver was the only team that saw that. Well, Larry Onoff, and through their own research with Vancouver, they were able to figure that out. They were, teams were waiting for him in 1990, although the Red Wings were looking to draft him after the eighth round when he'd be eligible to be drafted. Yes. teams And teams were ready to pick him up, but the Canucks take him in the sixth round, and it caused a huge fucking hullabaloo so much so that like they had directors storming the stage being like what the hell is going on this guy's not eligible vancouver is just like we'll settle it that'd be like an nfl team drafting like a 16 year old no seriously it was people were just confused yes and probably pretty angry because they had their sights set on him too yes because everybody saw him as uh if if we can get him out of russia he's going to be one of the best forwards but that's the thing is 
somebody said this they were like look vancouver did their due, due diligence they found out that they a hundred percent could draft him in the fifth round with cska uh, and then central red army and he played in all these international tournaments yep. which i'll get into later um in his career stats but yeah he for whomever was running the canucks that was amazing it was one of the best drafts because they really picked him up and this is something that other people said they were like oh yeah if we knew he was viable he was going to go in the second or third round like it yeah he was a great pickup that people were waiting on and the canucks got him so yeah the the red wings were prepared to take him in the sixth round also um and this did not get resolved until the 1990 draft literally the day of that draft a year later, they finally figured it out and awarded his rights to the Canucks. And the Canucks, you know, good for them because, as we'll talk about down the road, this is a goal scorer, one of the fastest skaters who has ever laced them up, and one of the league's most exciting players yeah. during his time in the NHL. Um, so we got to talk about him leaving, though, because... I talked about how he played for the Soviets in 89-90, but now it's 1991, and he ends up leaving on September 6, 1991. It goes to uh, Vancouver, and um, they paid the Soviet team $250,000 as he signs a four-year, $2.7 million dollar deal with an $800,000 signing bonus. Well, this was uh, settled in court too. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was settled in like a Detroit court that they had to pay 250000 to CSAK Moscow. And then uh, this is what I found interesting was he had such a huge signing bonus. But I feel like you see this with guys coming from like Russia who are like, yeah, I'm coming here with nothing. Right. <laughs> so, and I'm trying to bring my family. So can we get like a little bit bigger on a signing bonus? Cause that's huge for a $2.7 million contract for a kid who's 20 years old. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> a kid who's 20 years old. Um, his first practice for the team was uh, November 3rd, 1991. 2000 fans came yeah. to watch the open practice, which is like, cause Vancouver by this point is kind of been on some hard times as far as the franchise and going deep into the playoffs and making Stanley Cups. I think they made one back in the 70s. Yeah, I think. No, there was the one where they lost the Islanders. In oh, the yeah. Fosse episode. So, yeah, yeah, in the early 80s, late 70s. Um, the Vancouver son, Ian McIntyre, um, said he was uh, compared him to a rocket watching him skate. Uh, there was another person. It might have been him, too, that said he was the fastest Russian thing launched into the world since Sputnik, which was that satellite from the 50s. Well, they were saying he got this nickname as soon as he came into the league. Like it was, it came with him essentially. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something that developed. He became the Russian rocket and he really lived up to that first season. I mean, we look at it. 91-92, yeah. I mean. He started a little late too. This this court thing, um, I think he started a month into the season. Yeah. And he still had. 34 goals, 60 points. Yeah, 60 points and 22 goals in his final 23 games. So he's yes, picking it up. That was ridiculous. Yeah, he's really picking it up. Um, in the first round of the playoffs, they played the Winnipeg Jets, the old Jets, the current Coyotes. Um, in game six, he has a hat trick. Yeah. They were to force a game seven, which they eventually win, but they eventually lose in uh, the next round to uh, Edmonton. But he had uh, 10 points in his 13 playoff games, which is pretty darn impressive. <laughs> Uh, rookie of the year. Oh, yeah. Calder Trophy winner. I mean, how can you not with numbers like that? That's what they were saying was he yeah. was he was one of the best wingers at the time, let alone the best rookie winger. And uh, he also talked about his early days in Vancouver. Um, Igor Larionov was one of his teammates in Soviet Union, but also in America with the Canucks. And he got him acclimated to the city. He let him live with him for a bit, just like kind of somebody there to speak Russian with. Yeah. And like just somehow acclimate yourself to this brand new world that you've wandered into. Um, I'm sure Vancouver was completely different from a war-torn Poland. I mean, <laughs> Moscow. But you know what I mean. Like, Moscow. I, I'm sure it was just like everything was different, you know? Like, yeah. Just like, so that... Their free health care is better. <laughs> There's no gulags. Just like, wait, so who do we have to pay off to get to the practice? You're just like, you don't have to pay off There's anybody. No We're just Russian going to practice. Russian mafia with Burt Kreischer. Stealing no. your shit? No. Um, 92-93. Uh, even better. Now an all-star. 60 goals and 50 assists for 110 points. A first-team all-star. All -star. And uh, 
What we're going to end up finding out here, though, about Beret as he's lighting up the league and filling up the stat sheets and becoming just an amazing player, the team around him, it's almost like Theo Fleury in Calgary. You got just enough to make the playoffs, but then things happen. Yeah, they're not a team that's going to go far in the playoffs. And I'll tell you what, they it seems like they almost pick up kind of like gimme games if that makes uh-huh. sense and yeah. then once you get into like the nitty-gritty of the playoffs you're like you're not winning a seven no. game series but the next season is the exception to the rule 93 mm-hmm. 94 um he had a nagging groy injury but he still had 60 goals 60 goals and 47 assists that's what's absolutely ridiculous like he literally still has over 100 points and he had a groin injury like the whole season yeah and the thing was is down the stretch he was just completely crazy um uh 49 goals and 78 points uh during the latter half of the season um he also i did want to bring up scored 46.4 percent of his team's goals that year that's insane that is like ridiculous that's i'll tell you what that's something that beret could hang his hat on but that's something that the canucks should be ashamed of yeah (laughs) it's both they're just like our team sucks and so bad. That was in the final uh, 47 games of that season, that percentage. But their team, was, I'll take that back. Their team was actually pretty good this year. Well, the team is as good as the one last year, but they have a healthy Burray bag, and he's way better. And they sneak into the playoffs as a seven seed. They sneak into the Western Conference playoffs. Um, they play an incredible series, which we did bring up before in our Theo Fleury episode in the opening round against Calgary. Um, they, It's a seven game. It's one of the most exciting hockey series I've ever seen, actually. Yeah. They uh, forces it to seven games, but the Canucks end up winning. The Canucks end up winning. Beat the Flames. Then they beat the Flames. And then the next series against the Stars, he has six goals in five games against the Stars. Like, come on. And it sets up uh, an all-Canada. West. I'm not sure why Toronto's still in the Western Conference at this point, but but you know what? Set up a Leafs-Canucks battle. They're coming off that disappointing conference finals lost the year before there Toronto. were riots in canada there that year it's in canada but uh, but they beat the leafs they this is what's leafs. crazy they is... kill them they destroy them actually in that series um he had four goals and six points in the five games which sends vancouver all the way to the stanley cup in an, an incredible stanley cup final series if you've never seen it either they play the new york rangers who have not won a stanley cup since 1940 yeah <laughs> and Beret and the Canucks give them all they can handle in this series. They really do. Um, on uh, They take them all the way to seven games. Beret in this playoffs, they end up, and eventually lose at the last second against the Rangers, but he had 31 points in 24 playoff games that year. That's ridiculous. He was, without a doubt, he took that I'm the star of this team regular season into this playoffs and pretty much drove this team to the Stanley Cup. He put him on his back. Is what yeah. He did. I mean, and the kid, 22 years old? Yeah. 20, going on 23? Yeah. Um, what ends up happening, though, um, on June 16th, so the playoffs aren't over yet of that year. Um, the Canucks are like, okay, we have our guy. No matter how this pans out, whatever, at the end of the season, we, we got we to gotta get him signed. Um, he signs a five-year, $24.5 million deal. And... Part of this deal was his dad got to be the team's trainer and athletic consultant. And his dad's kind of a weird guy. Right now, uh, him and his brother, they, they aren't in his life at all. I don't know what happened between them. But. I was going to say, there's some weird shit that happens with this deal because they get this deal signed right after the Leaf series in this right in between Window, the Rangers yeah. series. And there's rumors that came out that he said... If this deal isn't what I want it to be, I'm not going to play in the Ranger series. Oh, man. And really? he's oh. come out multiple times and be like, that's horseshit. People put so many words in this guy's mouth, as we'll later discuss. <laughs> well, this is what comes back later on, where he felt like the relationship with the front office really deteriorated because they kind of put that story out there, where he was just like, that's insane. I was playing no matter what, but he was negotiating for higher money and for shit that is weird like getting your dad dad into this into the or like getting him a job which is just it's just weird overall and that's what people were saying was like there was just like backroom shit that was happening that was like not normal yeah it just 
weird. Just kind of just weird. Just weird. But just that, weird this stuff. is the thing: is he was just like, I never refused to play. Why the fuck would I not play in the Stanley Cup that I got us to? Yeah, right. Um, hey it, guys, I'm taking the next two weeks off. Yeah. Bye. It was over like two million. It was they wanted to give him like twenty two million, and he wanted twenty four five. Oh my god! And that it's one of those things where it stuck with him, and later in his career, he was just like, I wanted to get out of Vancouver. Nobody can blame you, bro. So. Hey. 94-95, the lockout comes, so he plays in Russia and Germany during what should have been the NHL season. Yeah, he eventually comes back. By almost like pickup games. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, scored 43 points in 44 games. Um, then they destroy the Blues in the first round of the playoffs. Seven goals, 12, uh, 12 points. But then get swept by the Blackhawks, and that was Burray's last postseason trip in Vancouver. Which is sad because they had that one and a lot of franchises have this, have that one shot and they blew it. You blew it. <laughs> you blew it. You miserable waste of life, you blew it. No, um 95-96 is an interesting season because uh he changes his number this year for a very important thing. You want to get into that? 10 to 96. Mm -hmm. Uh 96 has to do with the date that he came to America. I forget exactly. September 6th, 9-6. Se okay, yeah. September 6th. Um, and then he just starts to get injured. Yeah. Like, uh, not even like, oh, that's a little... Like, he got a really bad ACL. Yep, November 9th, 95, he tears his ACL. Um, then he, um, the following season, he hits his head in the opening game. Yep. Likely concussed. Um, he, he's come out recent or not recently, but later and said, I was 100% concussed. I said I had like a neck injury. Yeah. That's what he kept saying. It was just like, nah, my neck's, but he was, he was, had that brain fog. Oh, uh, that's yeah, good old CTE. Yeah. You know, that's uh, uh, been going around lately. <laughs> well, that's the thing is in that era, we, we were not looking at these brain injuries and he a hundred percent had one yeah. off of that first game and people were saying for like 20 games he did not he look right fog yeah, yeah he, he did he wasn't as quick he wasn't as just like smart on the ice it, it's it's an interesting kind of sad fucking thing with these guys when they get these injuries that don't get addressed and then he's still such a great player though because that year he had 55 points in 63 games likely sustained a horrible concussion yeah <laughs> or multiple uh, well that's the thing is that it might have just keep co compounding over like yeah so it was bad yeah um the uh following season um 97 98 he's back to number 10 again because he's just like that number's got some bad juju to it yeah um he has 90 points uh 51 goals and 39 assists i saw they brought in uh mark messier for this they did and that was, ended up being uh the west was so stacked at this yep. point that it was just like really what, what are you gonna do here like not Pavel can't do late 93 94 and just be like oh there's nobody else really good in our conference yeah um it held out in 98 99 um uh and because of this he signed with the Florida Panthers well this is the what I was alluding to earlier when he says um he wants to be traded at the end of the year they yeah. say no Mm -hmm. And then he says he'll never play in a Vancouver Canucks jersey again and holds out. Yeah. Like he, he legitimately holds out until like the the midway the through. The bitter end. Yeah. This is January when he signs. Yeah. January 17th. And uh, Vancouver yeah. finally had that realization like, oh, we have to trade him, which is kind of rare when you see this. But he literally went like back to Moscow. He's like, no, I'm not playing for the Canucks ever again. And they trade him to Florida, and you see on Florida, he's still a great scorer. Yeah, they signed him for five years, $47.5 million. Um, he scored eight goals in his first six games, but he gets hurt again. Yep. And this is kind of a recurring theme where it's just like, oh, God, just be healthy so we can watch you. <laughs> But uh, in 99-2000, he has an amazing season. He leads the league in scoring. Scoring leader, yeah. 58 goals, 36 assists, 94 points, and he makes it back to the postseason with Florida. Unfortunately, they don't, <laughs> they don't do very well. Yeah. Um, they are swept by the eventual Stanley Cup winning Devils uh, in the first round. But he was a second-team All-Star, and he had a hat trick in the All-Star game. Two of the assists were from his brother, Valerie. Yeah, which, which I love. Awesome. 
I always like seeing that when the Alomar brothers would play for the AL yeah. in the All-Star game. That was always fun. You, know, you kind of wonder what happened with that family because they are there's dysfunction throughout. So it's yeah. uh, it's an interesting one. But we see even in the next season for the Panthers, he's the goal-scoring leader. Yes. Uh, it's insane. 59 goals, 39, uh, uh, 33 assists, 92 points. And uh, this is another season through the, the entire season. He scores almost 30% of his team's goals. Yes. <laughs> like... That's awesome. Why don't you just pass the ball to Pavel or pass the puck to Pavel? You know, he'll get it done for you. Um, in 2001, 2002, the Panthers trade for his brother. So they're on the same team, which is pretty cool. But uh, very injury plagued season this year for him. Uh, limited to only 49 points um, before being traded that year to the Rangers. To the Rangers. I which think- I thought was interesting. They brought his brother in and he actually commented on the front office of the Panthers mm-hmm. and how much better it was than Vancouver. But I feel like they had a discussion where it was like you're done here. We Ford need to is rebuilding and they we need, need to pieces. offload your contract. And the and Rangers that's... are stupid and adding ridiculous contracts to their payroll it's like so true. Theo Fleury. <laughs> It is so unbelievably true because he gets traded to the Rangers and really doesn't play for them because injuries is kind of ends his career. And the Rangers had been wanting him before. Yeah, they wanted him from Canucks. Yeah, and Gretzky had even said he would have played an extra season or two if they got Pavel, which yeah. would have been pretty awesome. No, that would have been to, amazing. To watch. But yeah, so um, played uh, 12 goals and 20 points in 12 games. Um for a total of 34 and 69 points for the season. Uh, unfortunately, the Rangers don't make the playoffs. No. So. And then 2004, 2005, we all know it was a lockout. Yeah, because 02 and 03, injury plagued that year, only 21 points. Uh, knee injury again. 03, 04, he sat out because nobody claimed him in the waiver draft. And then 04, 05, lockout. Well, he said that. If they, if he had this opportunity to come back 2003 to 2005, he was ready, if you will. Yeah. Um, but then when the lockout came in, he was just like, I'm done. Because you really have to stay at like top shape. You know what I mean? You, you can't just be games. hanging out. Yeah. yeah. You can't just be Injured. hanging out, coaching youth, you know, sports and then get that call. Yeah. They, um, uh, November 1st, 2005, uh, retired from the NHL. Um, didn't want to play one of those guys who just didn't want to play if he wasn't a hundred percent. Yeah. Didn't want to show anything on the ice that was not up to his standards. Um, number 10 retired, um, in 2013 by the Canucks and they have an award named after him for the team's most exciting player. Cause they had most exciting player before and he won it like a whole bunch of times. Yeah. And then they're like, they just oh, named well, it, renamed it, renamed the Pavel it. Bure. But, um, yeah, do you want to talk about his style, or do you want to talk about his international career? Uh, no, let's get into his international, the okay. Rush, the Ruskies. Yeah, um, so he's on these really good Soviet teams, um, winning the uh, ESCO Cup in 1988, a gold medal, um, bronze medal winner at the Euro Junior Championships that year, uh, 1989 at the World Juniors. Um, that was a loaded team, uh, gold medal. Uh, 89 Euro Juniors, also the gold. So, I mean, like, this club team he's playing on and these national teams he's playing on are just winning everything. Yes. Um, 1990 World Juniors, they won the silver. 1990 Worlds, where he's playing with the adults, wins a gold medal. Um, In 1991, World Juniors... because So he's playing on the adult and the junior teams. Because he's so young. Yeah. They're just like, well, let's bring him up for this, you know. It's like September call-ups almost for (laughs) Russian hockey. But uh, in 1996... um, he uh, did not sign a petition to replace. He basically said, I'm a hockey player. I don't sign petitions. Yes. Like he, he, he didn't make it nothing political to ever. do yeah. with. And I think you're, you're in probably two camps when you're from a country like the Soviet Union. A, you want to make everything political. Yes. Or B, you're just like, leave me the fuck alone, please. I just want to play hockey. I just want to play hockey. Uh, in 98, he plays on the Russian team now. Um, the goal uh, plays in the Nagano Olympics, and they make it all the way to the gold medal game, but they're beat by Hashik and Yager um, uh, yeah, in uh, Russia. In or uh, Czech Republic, excuse me. Yeah. God, why did I brain fart? And then 2002, they win the bronze. So, like, successful. He's winning basically everything not in the NHL. 
Yeah, um, he, and he's making finals of pretty much anything not in the H- NHL. Mm-hmm. So, like, this Russian team, like you were saying, is just stacked. Yeah. Um, as far as his style goes, I know we brought it up a bunch of times, but his speed and his change of directions on skates are just something that are incredible. Which is awesome to think that his first tryout, he didn't make it because he was not good at skating, which makes you, he had to have just like focused in on that for years. I feel like Gordon Bombay would have taken his career to even further heights. (laughs) All right. I want you to pass me the egg. (laughs) Soft hands, soft, soft hands. hands. Um, but yeah, I, I thought well, he's about banging this. his mom. <laughs> I thought about this though, which was so weird. Like, if he was slightly bigger, would he have had less injuries? And then, if he was slightly bigger, would he have then been less effective? Like, it's one of those things where, like, he was so great. If he was just on a better team, he probably would have had multiple cups. See, I think sometimes guys are just who they are as far yeah. as their bodies and when they're at that one level that they're at their top level at that weight at that size you're more or less just like no just stay there yeah just just be who you are yeah uh trevor linden had a great quote about him uh he played with him in vancouver he said um i don't think i've seen or played with a player that's brought people out of their seats like that oh yeah because you look at some of these so exciting he was he's so like you get him on the breakaway and just his freaking sniper out there it was so good just so good and his 6.23 goals per game average i did want to bring this up is the third highest among the nhl's top 100 goal scorers of two guys we've done an episode on yep mario lemieux and mike bossy um so now do you want to get into the off-ice things? Yeah, get into some fun stuff. We get into some weird Russian stuff right now. Um, he had a little bit of ties to the Russian mafia, mm-hmm. uh, which I feel He's like the machine. it's a little unfair for these Russian athletes because a lot of the time, this is what I saw. They were just like, well, he was on both sides. He was being extorted, and he might have done a little extortion <laughs> because that's the thing is like, it all kind of ties in together where it's like, yeah, I had to pay some shit and then I had to tell somebody else they had to pay some shit. Please don't murder my family. Exactly. Like, <laughs> it, that's the only thing That's the only thing he's trying to do is just like, no, 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 I just don't want my brother to be killed. That's I, it. From what I've gathered, it's he knew people or were friends of friends of people yes. in the Russian mafia. He wasn't doing any of those no. things. He just happened to know who these people were or may have met them at one point in his life. I'm just saying, I'm pretty sure CSAK Moscow probably has that in their organization. So it was probably like that deep in it, you know, like it's, it's, that's what I mean, where you're just like, can you pick a hockey player from that era that didn't have involved we're like right yeah involvement like they, with the they russian said mafia? him and slava fatisov were laundering money for the russian equivalent of the godfather yeah so it's like how much of this is true how much of it isn't i'm saying no well that's what he said he was just like this this because i forget this guy's name but he was just like that guy's never been convicted of anything if he's a russian mobster then i'm you know yeah houdini kind of thing um, um, so he's gotten a little sue happy that's i was and gonna say he I'm sued a not couple saying of, he's wrong but some interesting things have happened with him in the Russian press and also on airplanes. Um, in 2002, the Russian newspaper The Exile um, brought up a story that they claimed to be a joke, but the reason Bure broke up with Anna Kornikova, who later married one of his uh, Russian teammates, Sergei Fedorov, um, he broke up with her because she had two vaginas. Two vajayjays. Two vajayjays, and not from Chernobyl. Which would have been more believable, but, you know. Well, that's what he said. It was like, it was ridiculous, but they needed to. I can't imagine what Russian tabloids are like. I know. because oh, It's they just must a be mishmash so of like depression and funny. Because he like, wins this lawsuit. He, oh, he wins. Yeah, he wins like basically the equivalent of $17,770. Yeah. And they file a retraction uh, December 27th, 2004. Um, and then 2012, I believe he's or, or 2004. Um, the okay. Russian cosmetics chain Arbat Prestige, Prestige Worldwide. Oh wide, no, wide. Um, they said he bragged to them about taking Kornikova's virginity. So what he does is get law. He gets in a lawsuit and he wins a settlement in October, uh, in November yeah. 2005. 
So you want to get onto the plane one? That was that's what I thought we were going There's to. There's too many berets on this fucking plane. But I mean, he keeps suing and winning, which is kind of one that of has those to things. Be exhausting to be him. Yeah. To be like, I don't want to do this, but I have to because it's horrible. Uh, so he gets kicked off of a plane in 2012. British Airways, yeah. Uh, actually, 2006. Six. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Oct- Halloween, actually. Oh, and wait, it's been a Halloween. The what he says is he was mistaken for some rowdy football fans. Yeah. Fo- for so soccer fans, um, and they're just getting crazy. And he was just kind of lumped in, like, yeah, this guy too. And he was just oh, like, no. no, I was just trying to like sit in my seat. <laughs> and it's one of those things where I bet they were just picking out anybody that looked like they were partying oh yeah totally and you know he's a famous face and uh got sixty-seven thousand rubles well he sued them because they put out a thing that he was being rowdy and you're just like no i wasn't and sued him and won you're lying yeah (laughs) dirty liars um so i did uh going over his career though his stats 437 goals 342 assists 770 799 points Calder Trophy winner, All Star Game seven times, and then a Hockey Hall of Fame in 2012. Man, the Russian of, Rocket, a ton of uh, international medals. And you got to give it up to him. Give for it that. up and give it up to his brother for marrying DJ Tanner, <sighs> meeting through a chance encounter with Uncle Joey. Boom, Pavel Bure. 